Go ahead and get us started. I just want to thank everybody for attending today's uh, Leading Patriots series. I'm really excited to get a great group of panelists together to talk about uh, really mission-driven organizations, charities, nonprofits, and, and the role they play in broader society right now. Uh, my name is Brett Josephson. I'm the Director of Executive Development and an Associate Professor of Marketing in the School of Business. I'm going to be introducing our panel in a, in a little bit, but I'm really excited by the leadership team that we have within the School of Business who are going to be setting up this topic as well as moderating this topic. Um, just a little bit in, in quick introduction, and I'm going to turn it over to the Dean of the School of Business. Um, but we're going to uh, just a quick little overview by uh, Dean Piperell, who's going to be talking about the School of Business and Mason's initiative to really push the idea of business as a better world and society and the role of business in, in setting uh, societal change. Uh, and with that, we're, we have three amazing panelists who are, who are real uh, embodiments about what it means to be a patriot. Um, three alumni who come from a diverse backgrounds in terms of where they're at Mason and what they're doing in the world today. And I'm really excited that that's gonna be moderated by Professor Ann Magro, uh, who is the Senior Associate Dean in the School of Business. Uh, she is also the co-director of our Business for a Better World Center. Uh, and an unbelievable accounting faculty member that we have. Um, as we get to that discussion uh, with the panelists, please you know, submit questions for our panelists, for the group, through the Zoom Q&A feature or through the chat. But before we get to those conversations and a little bit more about this series, I wanted to give a platform to, to Dean Piperell to talk about his vision and, and the school's vision and the university's vision around this idea of business being a force for good in the world and what that represents for the university moving forward. Thank you, Brett, and let me not forget to uh, acknowledge your efforts in getting the word out and connecting us, particularly with our community and our alumni community. I want to welcome all the alumni and friends of Mason that are here uh, this afternoon. It's a pleasure to have you with us. <coughs> Mission has to do with what you're trying to accomplish, not just today and tomorrow, but also um, out into the future and not just for the nearest group of uh, students and stakeholders, but also for the, the bigger group and, and the world going forward. One of the things that is very clear is that our system, um, and not, not only kind of locally and nationally, but, but our, uh, our global system or systems of uh, capitalist enterprise, um, while at the same time that they've uh, been flourishing in some dimensions have, have been uh, less than flourishing in other dimensions. And one of the roles, I think, of businesses and business schools is to paint that bigger picture or even just zoom out and see that bigger picture of what is an effective uh, global network of uh, free enterprise-based societies do? What is business's role in the wider world? My, uh, my friend and, and former uh, uh, doctoral colleague Rebecca Henderson, who's a university professor at Harvard, has just published a book called uh, Reimagining Capitalism in a World on Fire. And basically, what this is about, as, as is the business roundtable statement from last year, the conversations at the World Economic Forum in Davos for the last several years, um, it, it is about how do you take a great invention, which is capitalism, and make sure that it is serving uh, everyone, uh, or at least m most people, rather than just a few. And the way that Rebecca describes it is simply that um, we, if we, if the only thing we focus on uh, is uh, returns to shareholders, then we miss uh, some of the other basics, like um, the lifting up of. Uh, other stakeholders involved in the system and like the accurate uh, pricing and costing out of the use of resources, uh, the, the contamination of uh, air and water, et cetera. These things are not you know, separate from enterprise. They're related to enterprise, but what you have to have is a system that figures them all in. So whether it's about uh, the sustainability of the planet, whether it's about uh, fair treatment of all stakeholders or what have you, it's very clear that business is going to have to step up and thankfully to some extent is stepping up to help shape our, our global future. And uh, that's why we formed last year the Business for a Better World Center at the school 
uh, it isn't only just about the school and the school's programs. It's about how we develop uh, thoughtful and uh, future focused students, colleagues, uh, alumni, and, and other friends to make sure that what we're doing in business, uh, we do responsibly. And, and the neat thing is that so many people in the not-for-profit sector have been on this for years and get it. And part of why we're having the, the panel today is, uh, is to be able to, to make sure that that learning uh, is happening currently and intensively. So I wanna thank you all uh, for being here, Chris, Yoshi, Kimberly, and I, I really appreciate uh, your participation and, and, and your uh, input to help us think about these issues and related issues. And I wanna hand over to uh, Ann Magro, who's the Senior Associate Dean of the School uh, and really uh, has, has some of the best experience and scope on how we run as a school and is 110% uh, uh, involved, uh, motivated, knowledgeable about the Business for a Better World side of, of our operation. So, Anne, over to you, and thank you all for meeting. Thanks, Maury. Great. Thank you, Maury. Well, Yoshi, Kimberly, and Chris, again, I'd like to also welcome you here today. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. You each represent a very different type of nonprofit or mission-focused organization. Your organizations vary in size and structure and mission, so I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. You know, we find ourselves at a really, truly unique time in, in our recent history anyway. You know, we're in the midst of a pandemic. It's really the first time in a century that we've had to have the sort of, you know, response, widespread response across the entire country. And then at the same time over the last few weeks, we're in the midst of social upheaval as people are filling the streets, right? Trying to, uh, you know, trying to fight for, for racial justice. And so today our conversation is really gonna revolve around how you see your own organizations and other organizations like yours evolving in this current context. So if we could start, could you just talk a little bit about each of your own organizations and how you're dealing with the current challenges of COVID and the fight for racial justice. Oh, that's right. I was surprised you're supposed to kick off. Uh, well, with United Way, I mean, we are a membership organization of 1,800 affiliates through 42 countries, uh, and we have relationships in 119 countries in terms of uh, getting funding. So in terms of the last three months, the best way I've heard it, similar to what you just said, Dr. Magro, uh, we, look, we were looking at a pandemic from the teens, meaning in the 20th century, uh, an economic situation that hasn't really been seen since the 30s, uh, and then social uh, justice and just the race and equity issues that we're having over the past couple of months that are at a heightened sense that we haven't really seen since the 60s. So we add all those happening in three months, really the conversation is around relevancy, uh, making sure that your message is not just about what you're doing in immediate response, uh, but what you have been doing. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, health access, in, in terms of fighting the, the pandemic, uh, how your work is not just a nicety around race and equity topics, but, but really around uh, the business essential, uh, business essential piece of your work around race and equity issues. So I think that uh, combined with the fact that now more than ever uh, as nonprofits, we need to look at our funding, not just as gifts, but as investments. Uh, so really uh, being much more intentional about uh, the terming uh, of and how we call our gifts investments and providing return on investment information. So if you, you know, supported uh, COVID-19 response for United Way, then you will know where those dollars went, not just where those dollars went, but how they were invested and that return on investment in terms of outputs and outcomes uh, that you, you will receive based on that, uh, based on that investment. Do you want me to go next? Yeah, Yoshi, you want to jump in? Sure. I'm Yoshi from American Psychiatric Association, Chief of Staff there. Um, we're also a membership organization, but we also have a foundation arm as well. So we do both um, membership. Um, there's a membership component of 38 over 3,800 thousand members and also a public facing um, foundation piece trying to educate um, people on mental health and and how to talk with people and identifying um, uh, issues that may may come up in your families and also with kids um, regarding mental health. So that that's one of our focuses right now. Obviously, because of everything that's going on, um, we we try to uh, develop and um, 
uh, also have the conversations with different um, groups and coalitions about you know what what things are important right now to keep an eye on. Um, for example, we also have a, a workplace mental health um, group under our foundation, so we try to get the word out there about how employers should um, keep. Uh, have tips for them about what's important in terms of access to healthcare, uh, what's important to keep an eye on for your employees, um, especially during stressful situations and pandemics, um, and you know everything that's going on to um, uh, with uh, racism and violence right now too. And so um, you know it is a very stressful time. So we're 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 trying to be um, a good resource for uh, actually a lot of different groups out there. And I will say partnerships right now are, are important to focus on as well. Well, I'm Kimberly Farfone Boards and I am with a, a senior living community in Charleston, South Carolina. We have about 520 residents and about uh, 420-ish staff members at any one time. Uh, we have been uh, slightly even more challenged maybe because we are operating within individuals' homes, environments, and their, and their resident environments. So we have to um, put a lot of precautions in place because of the generality of what we do. But I think in terms of how it can relate to others um, in the nonprofit world and based off of what uh, Chris and Yoshi mentioned, um, really understanding your mission and making sure that you are expressing that mission um, in every one of your actions, um, both from a perspective of a business model, but also from the perspective of what is the right thing to do um, at any given time and making sure that you're doing that right thing. I think what um, uh, we have been able to do as a, a faith-based organization as well is really honing in on those fundamental principles within our mission statement and making sure that we are living those within our actions. The COVID issue has brought um, various challenges and, and, and nervousness and fear amongst a lot of our team members because of the fact that they are providing one-on-one -on -one care to individuals um, within our healthcare side of things. We also have, you know, sort of the independent apartment and cottage side of things where, you know, direct care is not necessarily being offered, but you're certainly providing um, support and, you know, and, and just being there for the resident environment. With the challenges that have been brought forth with um, the, the protest and, and, the, and the social injustice fights, that has brought a new layer to what we're dealing with now and a new, new frustration and concern and fear um, from our team members' perspectives and from um, the resident perspective of their concern for the residents, uh, for the team members going through this challenging time. And again, going back to our mission and, and leading by that mission statement um, within not only our communications internally, but externally. And that would be something I would love to talk further about, but how you branded, uh, how you brand your mission within your social media and how we've ensured that we are addressing um, and acknowledging what's happening and ensuring mental health and ensuring um, you know, speaking to, to your supervisors when you're frustrated or scared or nervous. Um, but certainly, I think going back to that mission and, and always questioning your, your um, alignment with that is critical, critical, not only at this time, but always. So in the current situation, do you find yourselves um, doing different things than what you were doing before? Are you moving out in new areas where you weren't working before? Or is it a, a change or maybe an emphasis on you know, a shifting of resources to put more emphasis on uh, priorities that are more closely related to what's going on right now. I think to Kimberly and Yoshi's point, it's really about the partnerships uh, and how you uh, really lock in on your mission. Uh, so our mission is we, we fight for, or our mantra rather is we fight for every person in every community around our three focus areas of education, income, and health. So we think about, uh, especially when you look at some of the, the COVID-19 uh, ancillary outcomes, it definitely pointed out uh, just some of the, the disparity in terms of those affected uh, just by race or community. And obviously, when we think about the social justice issues, a lot of the things that we need to do longer term are around what we've been talking about for you know several decades now around the divides. I mean, I think the last decade or so has been the digital divide, but then also the education and economic divide. So how we can kind of frame that uh, more importantly. So to Kimberly's point, really you know locking in on your mission, knowing what that means, no matter the environment. Uh, so 
So I wouldn't say it's necessarily a, a shift, but more intentionality about how you frame it. And then also from the partnership standpoint, it's really looking at the different issues uh, that we have in the world, especially from a United Way standpoint as being such a big convener in communities. How can we bring different sectors together? Uh, so how can we bring the faith-based community uh, together with other nonprofits, uh, together with the public sector, with, with folks in education, uh, as well as our key corporate partners to look at key issues and how we can leverage our quote unquote superpowers uh, together uh, to address those issues. Yoshi, um, what sort of partnerships has your organization been forming or different partnerships that you've either been relying on or forming in the current situation? Yeah, so uh, uh, we, we've been uh, reaching out to, we also have, we have a corporate advisory uh, council as well. So uh, we, we work closely with um, corporations and uh, different groups um, so that we can um, partner with them and get the word out and they help us also obviously train their employees um, so that they have you know the most up-to-date resources um, that they um, can share with their employees as well so we do um, we do reach out to private and public uh, partners um, also uh, health related organizations is a big one for us obviously because of our uh, uh, mission that's on mental health uh, so it's and, and and as well as you know i would say also with the um uh, uh in the private industries um it, it's it spans from you know different companies um, um and and just trying to get the get them on board as to why access to healthcare and mental health care is so important. Um, so we do that. And I, I think, um, and part of your question too, is we, we've had to redirect some of our priorities, um, uh, you know, given the, the, the tight budgeting that we're gonna have to do this year because of some of the lost revenue that we've had from, um, changing or, or canceling or moving um, in-person meetings to virtual meetings. Um, we've had to shift a little bit of our priorities to really focus on diversity and health equity issues um, as well as educational issues. So um, some of the focuses, you know, has, has been moved a little bit more towards that um, arena for us. Mm -hmm. So we talk a lot in times like these about the challenges that organizations face. And, and I think that question of what are the challenges that you think organizations like yours will have going forward. But I think that we also sometimes miss the opportunity to talk about the opportunities that arise in these situations. And so you know, what do you see again within your own organizations and, and those like yours in terms of you know, the, the major challenges that you think we're gonna see going forward, but also the opportunities that exist right now and, and how do we really take advantage of those? You want me to, to answer that? <laughs> um, a cup, I, I, I think that's a great question. I just want to go back one quick step to the partnerships, because I think that is, um, especially for your small and medium-sized nonprofits, uh, really, you are truly reliant on other small and medium-sized nonprofits and partnering with them and determining sort of how you can each benefit from one another. So within Bishop Gadsden, we have really tried to reach out and support those smaller and medium nonprofits who are kind of struggling right now, whether it's minor things, like we had to do meal delivery for all of our residents. So we had 420 uh, bags every day that we were delivering to our residents. Well, that's a huge waste of actually having these bags just sitting around Well, you can't use them for so many days because at that point, the virus was still potentially on paper. So figuring out how to partner with an organization to store those safely, so then, then they can be used at food banks. Um, those types of sort of thinking outside the box and figuring how you can partner with one another have actually been kind of exciting in this time. I think that one of the things that we have learned is that we really are reliant on one another. And, and going back to, to the Dean's concept of, you know, how do we be a, a force for greater good? I think truly nonprofits are a force for greater good. And I think we can even do a better job when we join together. Um, the other thing I mentioned about partnerships is, is sort of benchmarking or idea sharing. I think nonprofits do a beautiful job of sharing how we can each benefit from one another in supporting of, you know, I was asking at Yoshi before we started, like, how, how are you handling 
um, your staff when potentially their spouse or partner has been affected by COVID. Um, those types of, of, of information sharing, I think, is so uh, welcomed in the nonprofit world and can be extremely beneficial. Now, to your point about um, sort of shifting and changing and, and where are we aligning things differently and, and have there been opportunities, I think what we have seen is the need for people, and this goes back to Chris's point, of seeing their dollars in action um, and understanding that when they're giving money to XYZ, um, they want to sort of lay eyes on that um, concept to see how is their dollar really moving forward and, and supporting other people. Um, within the Bishop Gaston community, our residents are so generous, but they see how hard and how challenging and how nervous a lot of our team members are. So they have given anonymous gifts to support a general fund of, um, of team members to be able to apply for those do dollars should they need it. They wanna give additional dollars to the organizations that we wanted to align this year, which happen to be organizations dealing with homelessness and, and food insecurity. Um, so I think that there's actually been an advantage to kind of being in this isolated time where people are seeing that they really can have a great impact when they spend a little time, do their research, and then that organization in turn makes sure that they're uh, spending the time and doing the research and communicating with one another. I think it's a great opportunity for, for all parties. I just want to uh, jump in here as the voice from the, the outside. I'm, I'm moderating the, the Q&A in the chat. So uh, for our audience, you know, feel free to continue to ask questions uh, and I'll, I'll come in and jump in. But Actually, Sumit has a, a great question, one that I've been curious about, and I just because it, it builds on this idea of opportunities. But with the current shift in working environments, have you and your organization seen a shift into in-kind donations of time and expertise versus the giving of financial incentives? That, and do you see that as both a long-term trend, if that is the case, a long-term trend developing in terms of philanthropy? People are going to be more willing to give time and expertise versus financial resources. Well, Samit, uh, thanks for the question. I think um, in terms of the in-kind donation from you know the workforce or just uh, people that want to be engaged more with United Way and other nonprofits, I do think that's something that's going to happen more now and something that's later. So to, to answer you know Ann's question directly, I actually was going to break it down into two parts. And the internal part, you know, in terms of our staff, is we've become a lot more flexible and nimble and understanding how to manage the remote work environment. Uh, so in terms of alighting for administrative hours, uh, knowing that folks are gonna work more when they're at home than when they're in the office because they don't have to deal with commutes, they don't have to necessarily deal with uh, you know, the, the interruption, people coming in and out of their offices. However, uh, that you also have to make sure you're taking care of your family. So to be more uh, flexible and understanding uh, more about the work-life integration uh, you know, with, with having a family, being at home and everything that we're dealing with uh, in the external environment. So in terms of our, of our corporate partners or our donors or our uh, folks that want to be engaged uh, with United Way, definitely seeing uh, more of an opportunity to engage with our larger corporate partners uh, who have folks that uh, may not be as engaged uh, based on especially the COVID-19 uh, shutdown. Uh, so they are looking for, for opportunities to, to leverage more of their, their talent and their time uh, in addition to their treasure. So I would say in terms of what we've seen in the short term is the companies themselves are giving more of the, of the dollars, uh, but then they are in, uh, encouraging their employees uh, to do more of the virtual volunteerism. Uh, so, that, so that's something that we foresee not only happening now, but I don't think we'll go back to an old normal, uh, but rather a new normal that will allow for more uh, remote working uh, and in turn will allow for more remote and virtual volunteerism. So, so absolutely, I mean, I think it's short term and long term. Yeah, and I, I agree. I think uh, for us, um, you know, we're assessing sort of where we are in terms of of where we'd be at this time in terms of our contribution or received contributions from um, from people, and we are a little bit down, I think, this year. Um, but you're right. I think uh, the in kind um, volunteer, and uh, uh, I think the effort to also provide information. Um, people want to help on uh, committees that we have to, to volunteer their time to develop um, good materials to share with the public. So I think um, some of that has shifted a bit 
Um, but for all for good reasons, I think um, online engagement is up, service engagement is up, and also our educational resources. Um, the, the amount of hits that we get online are also up and the requests for them through our customer service center is up. So I think that's uh, positive. Um, you know, I think we'll see where we end up at year end, uh, just depending on how things go. But, um, but it, you know, it is a very, uh, very good contribution. Do you think that this is going to change the way as you move forward and trying to, to, you know, using Chris's language to seek those investments in your organizations and in your activities? Um, is this going to change the way you do that in the future? Um, you know, do you, and even as a starting point, do, you, do either of you use this uh, focus that Chris does on really, you know, when you're talking to potential investors, talking to them about the investment and, and talking about the returns they will get on the investment? Do you see this as a shift in the way we raise the money for our activities. Yeah, I think it, I think there is going to be a shift because um, normally I'll, we receive a lot of uh, contributions um, and support through our in-person meetings. So for us, definitely, we're going to have to change. Uh, we're looking to change that model as we speak because uh, we aren't just we aren't going to be able to capture that. Um, so we're looking to do things virtually um, and maybe have uh, more uh, so, uh, I guess focus areas that we talk about virtually um, and, and so a lot of it right now is provided um, free and so um, you know we're going to do that for a little while but we might need to mix it up a little bit later um, you know and start asking for contributions or donations um, as we as we uh, as each month kind of goes by and as we assess uh, what we currently need. So we were talking a little bit about the new normal um, and telework and telework be becoming perhaps more accepted um, and more commonplace. But there has been a lot of talk, you know, when you're reading, uh, you know, in the press about how the current situation with telework has really just sort of exacerbated the income divide, right? And those of us who have office jobs that we can do from home with telework um, tend to be the people who are, you know, are higher wealth, higher income to begin with, and it's really the people at the lower end of the socioeconomic status who are struggling the most. And then even within the telework world, there's been a lot of recent research that's come out that's really talked about how the gender imbalances that we have in terms of caring for the children and caring for the home and the workplace have, have also been exacerbated um, in this telework situation. There's an interesting statistic in, um, in academia that says that during this time that we've been on lockdown, um, men have been submitting like i can't i'm gonna get the wrong number wrong but it's something like five times as many papers academic papers as women have submitted during the same period of time um you know so we're all at home working on our research on our teaching etc and, and men are kicking out papers and women are, are not um do you see any of that um in your own organizations or have you thought about that within your own organizations and how do we you know if this if this is is going to become the new normal with you know more more teleworking and more of this sort of mix of, of home life and work life coming together, how do we make sure that that is uh, applied in a way that's fair um, and that, you know, really everyone can benefit from? So, Anne, I'd like to, to take that because I think we're a good microcosm for that within where I am, is that we have, you know, people who are providing direct care. You can't do that from home. You have right. to be face to face with individuals. Um, and honestly, what we have done with our, our team members and our administrative staff is really said, we are one community here, and we would really like to, to be one community together. If there are extenuating circumstances which require you to potentially work from home, we can discuss that, but we want to treat people as equally as we possibly can because uh, a team member who is a, a certified nursing assistant, a housekeeper, a floor tech, somebody in the, in the uh, kitchen areas, they should not necessarily be treated differently than myself. So we have tried to really create that equal footing as much as possible. It's a challenge. And I think that uh, the other thing that we've been able to do is, is reward those uh, frontline staff members with maybe additional income um, at this point in time. Um, the leadership staff's not obviously gonna be receiving that. So kind of um, trying to, 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 to do certain things to let them know we understand it's not fair, but we're trying to do everything we can to make it as fair as possible. Yeah, that's great. They're really recognizing those people who are on the front line, right, whose jobs have to be done there in person uh, is really important. 
Are you seeing any of that, um, Yoshi, I mean, especially through the work with mental health issues? Are you seeing uh, differences in um, the experiences, you know, that, that we're seeing among, say, women versus men or, you know, higher socioeconomic status versus lower socioeconomic status? Yeah, I think I think we're seeing a little bit of that. Uh, um, you know, we do also work in re in the research field as well. So um, that's an interesting statistic that you pulled in terms of, you know, men submitting more papers. Um, and and we I think also take a, a similar stance um, as Kimberly said. We try to. Um, treat our employees um, and, and our members as, as fairly as possible. And we do try to um, make sure that, that they are, we are being as flexible as possible too, because we realize that um, you know, people who are teleworking from home who may have small kids at home that they have to juggle uh, being you know, a, a teacher, um, babysitter, um, and worker at, all at the same time. So. Um, we do try to uh, remind the managers too at our organization that uh, we really do need to be flexible with when they're getting their work done. Um, just because uh, parents, you know, may need time to shift different schedules and they might be able to do more work at night versus like during the day. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, we, we, we try as, as best we can uh, to, to, to do it that way. But it is, as Kimberly said, it, it is very challenging. Yeah, it's an interesting challenge as well because we try to be flexible, right? And we're all working. I was working till the wee wee hours this morning because uh, that was the time that was available for me to work. Um, but at the same time, we, we going back to the issue of mental health and, and taking care of self-care during this time is how do we not let work take over everything we do? And I think you see that especially with people who are working in nonprofits, right? Um, you know, not-for-profits and the mission-focused organizations because generally you're, you're there because you have a passion for what you do, right? And it's so easy in that situation to let the work overtake you. Um, yeah. People get burned out, right? I mean, that's a, that's a very common issue, as I'm sure you know. Um, and, and I think in this context, it can be particularly so. That's, that's very true. That's a very important element. I think, you know, we try to um, also share advice about setting boundaries and a work schedule, um, if, if at all possible, and to prioritize uh, your mental uh, well-being as well, uh, because it is um, it is tough to juggle all these things right now, and um, staying active, getting some fresh air, um, and actually, the one of the most important things is really connecting with your social network, um, because so many of us are homebound, and um, you know we're trying to do our part in um, self-isolating, um, and and I think sometimes too that connectedness is. Is, uh, it's very hard to do sometimes when you can't see people or, or go out for um, you know barbecue or picnic or or whatever the case may be it's it's hard to interact and so we, we do try to um, to basically give advice about how to do that in a virtual way if I can just jump in one other thing I'm sorry Chris just okay, um, the the issue of the going back to taking care of your staff and, and families is we have actually aligned with other nonprofits to help provide um, babysitting services for our team members who have to be at work and work the front line um, because schools were closed and uh, they didn't have that option of having that, that care during the day. And then at night, their spouse might be working a different time period because of what was happening. Um, so that's been a great opportunity to not only serve our team members, but also partner with other organizations and provide that, that service, which is really needed. Go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry. Absolutely. Well, to kind of elaborate on that, I think, you know, it's not just the talk, it's the action, right? So you're actually doing something to show that you care about your employees. And then also a lot of people say, well, oh, that's, that's a nice to have. No, that's a must have from a business imperative, right? When you think about uh, the health and well-being of your employees, their, their productivity, uh, you know, their, their overall happiness, you, uh, you know, to Yoshi's, uh, their work in terms of the, the mental health cases, we're starting to see a rise in, in calls, uh, to, to our 211 service is very similar to 411 or 911, but you call for health and human services referrals and not necessarily just for, you know, rent and utility assistance anymore, or how do I get tested for COVID? It's around mental health and, and, and how they sustain themselves. So uh, it's not just a nice to have, it's a business imperative. And to Yoshi's uh, point as well about 
you know, managers have to show that, right? So when you talk about it, it, we're going to be flexible with your work hours. No, show that. So if you send an email, you know, at 1030 AM and you don't get a response until 930 PM that, that, that night or the next day. Okay. That's okay. Um, and then also just as organizations, when you do a lot for, for time off, you know, really, really shut down, like use your uh, delayed receipt on your, you know, on your email sending, if you can, or things like that, when it's not imperative, right? If something can wait until the next day, let's not, let's not put unnecessary pressure uh, on our staff and really, really not just from a nice to have, but from a must have, uh, make your staff's, you know, health and well-being part of your business imperatives. So Brett, are there uh, any other questions that you'd like to bring forward? I thought I'd Oh, of course there are, Ann. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, uh, I, there's, I, obviously, I, I think the discussion right now has been absolutely fantastic, and I, and I can see why there's some people asking uh, for some really good, I, I think, advice. But one of the things that came in, I want to get to this uh, question from another Ann, um, but you know, their organization has been doing a lot of these kind of events, webinars, new ways to engage uh, members, and they're driving up member activity. But the idea is how do you maintain your engagement with these individuals after this period is over with? That you, you, know, you do see an increase in philanthropic giving around events, exogenous shock. They give the idea of like the ice bucket challenge. And I think it, you know, something that I've seen in my research that in this space that you know, charities, nonprofits, mission driven do struggle to maintain that level of activity with donors once these kind of exogenous events are done. Um, so what are some of the strategies that you see to, to maintain engagement with those donors? Well, I'll say from a United Way standpoint, I mean, we want to create uh, donor journeys for those who are new to uh, our organization in terms of giving, you know, through the, through the COVID, COVID pandemic uh, and really understanding the touch points, you know, getting to know them a little bit better in terms of, you know, what they're interested in, not just around the pandemic, but, you know, why, the, why, why they gave to something to support the pandemic? Did, were they concerned uh, about the disparities in those who were affected by COVID? Were they concerned about uh, just some of the, the education and digital divide uh, during this time for those who weren't able to do remote learning or remote work uh, because of their, their lack of Wi-Fi, their lack of, of hardware, things like that from, uh, from home? So really understanding the donor more, uh, but then uh, more importantly, I think I, I read some of uh, Ann's comment and question there, we think about the return on investment, uh, being more proactive about that as well. So in terms of uh, creating more uh, impact funds, if you will. Uh, so I know that's a touchy subject uh, in the nonprofit world around restricted versus unrestricted dollars. Uh, but some of the dollars have to be restricted because that's where folks want to invest. Uh, so if you can follow their donor journey to that point uh, where they want to invest in a certain fund, uh, to, to use a, a banking term there, uh, we want them to do that because we want we want to show them the return on investment for which they're looking, uh, and then to your point, how you know we can sustain them um, a, as a partner, as an investor, in the impact that we're trying to create. Yeah, I think that's definitely true, and um, I, something that we also try to do is we put them on. We we have newsletters that go out about what we're doing and um, some activities that we're working on. So we put them on those group lists so that they're aware of um, you know where their dollars go and um, and oftentimes they're interested in some of these activities. So um, sometimes you know it's helpful to have them on committees um, that they can be a part of. So that that's that's something that we try to do. One of the things that I think is going to be really um, interesting is um, we're sending out communications almost daily now to our donors because they're also part of our community. If I put my my other hat on when I'm when I'm a board member or working with other nonprofits, um, it's interesting because they're not quite doing that touch as much as they need to be. Even even though our touch from uh, the Bishop Gasson standpoint is not asking for money. It is a touch that they are giving, getting from us. And I think my advice to nonprofits, especially those small and medium ones who might not have the sophistication or the, the, the team member uh, talent pool like a United Way might, um, is, is do try to have these regular touches. And it, it doesn't need to be fundraising related. It can simply be 
uh, this is how what's happening today. This is what that this is what we're dealing with. I think the more that you can um, either virtually, electronically, or personally make a connection with your donors, telling them your story, that's going to have to continue even further down the road. But especially now, from that small and medium standpoint, I think a lot of them just kind of shut down because they didn't really know what was where their role was going to be, what they were going to do, and they, they, they haven't quite figured out how to adjust. So I've been working with two, two nonprofits to tell them, you've got to start communicating. You've got to start showing what you're doing, even if it's little things. You've got to tell them that their investment, as Chris has talked about and has talked about, is continuing even in this time. So I would just encourage whether you have somebody on staff now or you can look for somebody who's sort of like your engagement officer and is really just kind of making those touch points on a, on a regular basis, I think is going to be critical now, but even more so as we move forward. You know, to elaborate on that, Kimberly, uh, totally agree. I mean, you mentioned some of the small to mid-sized nonprofits, and we think about you know donor journeys. You know, they may sound complex or you know involving algorithms, things of that nature. But it literally is as simple as a proper thank you, uh, informing the donor about where their investment is going, and then offering them the opportunity to engage more in the work. Uh, be it, you know, in person when hopefully things free up or virtually. So, I mean, it could be, you know, literally that simple. You don't have to, you know, use, uh, you know, m mind based types of things in, in terms of understanding a person's, you know, personality or interests. One of the things that we found really easily is just doing, you know, quick um, iPhone videos that we've been sending to some of our donors who are not within our community, but maybe outside of our community. So they're really not here because they're not allowed to come in here right now because of the restrictions. But, um, you know, just quick little videos saying, you know, hey, Bob, just wanted to thank you. We just received your gift. It's a little bit more casual. So you can, you know, you need to, to figure out who that is, uh, who, what donor is right a message. But yeah, I think touching thank you notes, quick little videos, anything that's letting them know that their money is making a difference is going to be critical. So how do you how do you assess the effectiveness of those strategies, right? And those engagement strategies, um, and finding that fine line between keeping people engaged and overloading them to the point where they just quit reading your emails or you know quit opening the videos. Well, I think we we leverage uh, we use a pretty standard benchmark of seven touch points per year. Uh, we we see this uh, with an uptick during this time because people have requested more and more not only for return on investment, but just understanding, uh, the, you know, Yoshi and Kimberly both mentioned like what's happening today, like what, what's happening in the world. So people have requested more uh, touch points for now, but as we start to, uh, to get more into the, you know, the, the longer term recovery and the rebuild and the kind of reimagining, if you will, a after COVID, you know, we'll start going into more of that, the basic, you know, one, you know, once a month, once every other month in terms of touch points uh, and limiting the types of asks so understand what you're asking for before you before you make the ask. So doing doing things like that just to keep to keep folks engaged without inundating them. I mean, the worst thing that you want to see, and we we obviously we keep track of folks that unsubscribe, you know, after we we've, we've added them to our, our newsletter, and then we look at uh, you know donor segments in terms of uh, who's a repeat donor uh, after giving in in times of disaster or now a pandemic. Awesome. We've got um, some more here to want to start get, getting to. Um, when <clears throat> on the topic of business imperative, nonprofit workers are often passionate about the work they do. Uh, having a family who's in this space, you know, I know that they they work their tails off. They generally do it um, for probably less money they could get in the private sector, commercial sector. So I'm kind of adapting this question. But uh, so if you look at this as people who are leading organizations, leading units. How do you maintain and retain your employees um, to both keep them within the organization and then also making sure that you can afford to pay them a livable wage? I think that's the, the flexibility. Uh, uh, and then also when you think about nonprofits and even at our highest rate, we probably aren't paying as much as some of our private sector uh, counterparts. So, so you really have to be more tailored in your approach in terms of motivating staff. So instead of having, you know, one, you know, one set of rules applies for all. I mean, you obviously have protocols and rules within your, your cultural foundation, but really understand what, what motivates your employees. And a lot of times uh, for, for nonprofit uh, folks, sometimes money is more motivational than you would think. So, you know, offering is, as Kimberly mentioned, offering them, 
you know, opportunities, especially during times like this, uh, to, to earn more, you know, making sure that, um, that, that management is doing what they can to, to spread out, uh, you know, some of the uh, salary increases, things like that, uh, when it comes time for performance reviews, but really just getting to know your staff and understanding what motivates them. So I think it's, uh, it's more of a business imperative uh, from most, you know, most for-profits because they pretty much have a type. If you want in, great. If not, you're out and they can, and they can replace you with, within a couple of days. And some nonprofits are like that too. But I think from, from our standpoint, we really want to understand, uh, from United Way standpoint, we understand what motivates our employees and actually execute on that. So again, it's, um, uh, as, as Kimberly and I used to say back in our student senate days, you know, talk is cheap. You don't want to be the NATO person, no action and talk only. You, you have to follow it up with action. Isn't that right, Kimberly? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, and, and it's in addition to what Chris just said, I think we try to have, we, we try to um, have a well-being, we have a well-being committee that's staffed by our employees. Um, and so they help like organize activities um, that, that really, um, you know, you can, you can sense the camaraderie that comes out of a, a employee-based volunteer committee. Um, and one of our groups is looking at trying to do like a yoga class online, um, a Zoom yoga or meditation yoga. Uh, so they're so they're looking at different things um, that, um, you know, even though re resources are limited, there are ways in which to do those things, um, especially if you have connections with different people in the community as well. So that's how we try to do it at our place. One of the things that I've done uh, while I've been here in Charleston is I was a guest uh, speaker, guest teacher for the Citadel on uh, marketing and nonprofits. And probably every semester I would get the question, so does working at a nonprofit mean no profit for you? And um, I always thought that was an interesting perspective from the outside because um, while it might not be um, always economically advantageous to choose the nonprofit side of things, I think that in a way, you almost need to, to treat your nonprofit staff as a donor. You have to steward them. You have to um, connect with them. One of the things that um, I work with Habitat for Humanity, and we've done um, some great things with connecting the homeowners who are the recipients of the hard work that the team members are putting in to back to the team members. So the homeowner is actually writing thank you notes to, to the staff member saying, you know, thank you for being a part of an organization that provided me the opportunity to own my own home. And I think you know, that circle of support is really important and it makes working at a nonprofit special and unique because you are touching people's lives and and in the business world you're touching people's lives as well but when you have a mission organization that has a specific purpose um, United Way has many purposes that reach so many different ways um, Yoshi your organization is focused on mental health which is critical but any nonprofit has a mission and being able to connect back to those that are the recipients of that mission to thank those that are making that mission happen is really a unique thing. Yeah, and in this whole discussion, I've been sitting here acting as if I'm on the outside asking you questions, but in fact, you know, Brett and I also work for a nonprofit institution, right, in a, in a public university. Um, and you're right, I mean, tying, tying the work back to the mission, reminding people why we do what we do and how what they do contributes to our progress, right, and to the education of our students and to giving back to our community and all the things that we try to do with the university. And, and it's really key, right? We couldn't do it if we didn't have people who were passionate about it, who wanted to be here. And, you know, again, we're willing to do it sometimes for less money than they would get for similar work in, in, in industry, for sure. Uh, Brett, did you want to bring more questions or should I move yeah, on? Yeah, we'll, we'll do uh, just a couple more. I think I can synthesize a couple of these into one broad theme is, uh, you, see, you were bringing up kind of this idea of community and somebody mentioned, you know, now that times are, um, you know, we're going through this kind of disruptive environment and it's bringing the question potentially, what was the mission of the organization or what's its purpose? So the idea of how you've been innovating your business models and are there new ways in which you can, expand the horizon of what the organization is trying to do to bring in new donors, new, new partners, uh, just bringing a point from Kimberly, you know, new players that expand and change potentially what the focus and vision of the institution is. 
Yeah, I think I think there's definitely a way to do that. Um, we're working really hard um, to see what the different angles may be. Um, you know, as we go through this very unprecedented time, um, whether we use um, our contacts that we have to uh, get speakers out there um, so that they talk about a topic that's very relevant today. I think that um, it that actually has spurred up a lot of attention, um, not only on our website, but also uh, with the, the, the people that we work with and our members. So, um, you know, there are different angles to take and um, we're, we're looking at everything right now, to be honest, because um, so much of everything is up in the air and, um, and yeah, it is, it is really hard, right, to figure out what those, I don't think we have like um, a million dollar solution or anything like that yet, but it's going to take um, a couple of different things to try uh, that may be new um, that we haven't really thought of doing or going back to, to partners that um, we haven't, you know, maybe we took a break from working with particular groups in the past. Um, maybe reaching back out to them to see if there's interest in in working together on something that we can both invest in and, and move forward on. So, yeah, it's 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 really hard, um, and we're we're also trying to just figure it out. I, I think, um, and I know all of the, the the rest of the panel could really add to this point, but I want to make sure we're getting to some of these questions. And I think this one. Um, you know, especially since the three of you are in senior positions within your organizations, I actually really like this question from Kevin uh, in the chat that if you're a, if you're a mid-level manager, somebody lower in the organization, but you see either a missed opportunity or you're seeing inequity in how the organization is being run or in kind of how it does its process, how do you bring that up safely and to enact change within your organization? Um, how do you be that agent of change within your company if you're not at that senior level? Um, and I think that for getting advice from you three is going to be uh, critical for that. So uh, Kimberly, maybe you'd get us started and then go from there. Sure. Um, so again, I think it depends on the size of your organization and what layers you have within the organization. If you have a really comprehensive HR department that can assist you with that, obviously that's a direction to go. But if you're a more smaller organization that your HR person is actually also the accountant or the office manager at the same time, it is hard. Uh, one of the things that I actually did personally when I was working um, in a previous nonprofit is, you know, you can't just talk about it, put it on paper. Um, maybe put something in writing that really expresses uh, where you see the opportunity and the missed opportunity and maybe do a little bit of your research find out um, You know, you know X amount of donors have already expressed interest in supporting this direction or um, You've had conversations with other team members who feel the same way um, as you do. I think talk, you know Chris talk is cheap action is is, <laughs> is, is is the way to go So putting it on paper as an action plan of the steps that need to be taken Are there additional resources that you need to to look at bringing in? Um, is it a, does it involve more IT? Does it involve an additional staff member? Whatever have you really, you know, put your business plan together basically and, and present it on paper. If you don't have a executive director or, or a, a president and CEO who is responsive to that, you have a board. Go to the board. You know, the board is is the is the really the boss in charge. Um, uh, um, that I think you should consider that not in an inappropriate way. But in a way of, you know, I'm a concerned staff member. I've come to my supervisor. They haven't really um, taken this uh, as a look. I'd like to present this to the board. So put it on paper and, and figure out if your supervisor is not the right person, maybe somebody from the board. Uh, agreed. And I think also, you know, fa being fact based, but then also during these unprecedented times where, you know, these key uh, issues are being brought to the forefront. I mean, this is the time for agitation. So I, I have a mentor who was uh, formerly a chief diversity officer of a Fortune 50 company. Uh, and we talked on Friday. He said, if you don't see things going the way that they should, he feels that they are at United Way, fortunately. He said, but this is a time for agitation. He said, now when we say that word, that may have a negative connotation. However, uh, if you come with facts and, and if you have a reputation in, within your organization that builds you gravitas, knowing that you're not coming to quote unquote complain, but really coming to point out an issue 
and how your company can be at the forefront of solving that issue, then that agitation, the, the word before that is respectful uh, agitation. So I think that's, uh, that's, this is a time for, the, for that type of respectful uh, agitation. But again, to Kimberly's point, you know, being fact-based uh, and working through the proper protocols. Uh, me, me personally, I'm not, you know, you can go, you know, if you need to reach out to our CEO or if you need to reach out to a board member, if you're on our team, hey, that's fine. Because that means that uh, either we've exhausted uh, our conversation or you know, I didn't give you what you needed. So I, I'm fine with that. But just know, try to go through your protocols first. Don't want to do something that is uh, career hurting uh, to anyone. But again, but, but this is the time for respectful agitation. Yeah. And I, oh, oh, I was just going to say, and to add to that, if there are any friends or allies, you know, that you have at your organization, um, oftentimes it's good to, to, to just um, present those ideas with your colleagues and people who have a good reputation at the organization. Well, we're almost out of time here. Um, what I, I kind of want to end with, you know, Maury started by talking about our, our you know, our vision and the vision of the center is that uh, business is a force for good in the world, right? So that's our future ideal state is that business is a force for good. Um, so what does that look like to you? You know, from the perspective of each of your organizations and when you look out on the issues that you're working on, um, how can business be a more positive force in the world and how can businesses, NGOs, and governments really work together to pursue a more just, free, and prosperous world? Well, I see the for-profit and nonprofit sector more blending. Uh, so I think the best way I've heard it put is it's not necessarily for-profit or nonprofit anymore. It's either you're for a mission or you don't work for a mission, right? You work typically uh, just for just for benefit or profit. So I think as we can look at ways uh, from a nonprofit perspective to convene uh, our, our private sector counterparts uh, to look at ways where they can look at their business superpowers, if you will, uh, to be more of, a, of an impact uh, and a mission for, for communities. And we can do that through our, our private sector partners, as well as involving some of the public sector uh, to come together to look at key issues. And I think it's something that, uh, that can be done uh, you know, within, all, within multi-sectors, if you will. So I know I mentioned that early in the call, but really the multi-sector piece and, and you know, showing businesses what their superpowers are and how they can, um, how they can support communities. Real quick, just an example. Uh, Lyft, uh, they're a competitor of Uber, uh, so they they have rides that they that they offer to benefit to benefit some of our two one one callers. So when they need a ride to medical appointments or to job interviews, so they do that. They can't afford to give all of those rides, uh, you know, free of charge in, in terms of no one paying for it. So we have some of our other partners that want to see more potential employees come to their job interviews, more uh, folks get medical access. So they're actually giving to that program. So, you know, that's a way where, uh, you know, folks are, are coming together and leveraging their superpowers. But at the end of the day, uh, it's benefiting the community. That's great. Thanks, Chris. Yoshi, do you have any final thoughts yeah. on that issue? And, and I think um, just, um, I, I think we referenced this earlier too, is, is if um, for-profit and nonprofit, if, there could be, you know, more coalitions or partnerships between the two. Um, I think they complement each other fairly well, actually, in, in certain industries. Um, and so you can, um, you know, you could have a really good partnership uh, between groups. And I think that that definitely becomes a resource um, and helpful. And, and actually, the other piece is, yeah, being a resource to the community. Um, and I do like Brett's um, plug there for the Mason alumni group uh, putting up the Patriots for Life website. So I'll have to say that as a board member myself on Mason alumni, thanks for putting that resource up on the chat box, Brett. Um, but yeah, and, and really- Jen made me do it. She was, she was forcing <laughs> me to do it. So. <laughs> it yeah. So thanks. Yeah, really being a resource for the community and others out there. I think um, demonstrating where you are making a difference is really critical. I think one of the things that nonprofits don't always, and again, maybe it's the, the, the more smaller to medium size, we don't always do a good job of telling our story. So I think that we've got to do a better job of demonstrating where we are making the impacts in the community and how the change is happening. And that goes to those, those uh, for-profit and nonprofit partnerships. Um, sometimes people think the for-profit's just doing it for that you know, PR side, 
but there's truly an honest link between between the desire to support and make the world a better place um, from the business side as well. So I think that nonprofits need to do a better job of telling their story, not only the donor story, the participant story, the staff member, all of it together. We just need to do a better job of telling that. All right. Thank you, Brett. And to you. I think that's awesome. We've obviously hit the top of the hour. I want to thank the panelists once again for spending you know, so much time out of their day. Um, and I think we need a part two of this, absolutely. And I think we only scratched the surface on topics to uh, Yoshi, Kimberly, Chris, you know, we'd love to get you, continue to get you more involved. I know you're all uh, huge uh, supporters of the university, supporters of what Mason is doing. Um, I do want to continue uh, to support this initiative. So we have additional webinars even this week. Uh, that we have one on the hospitality, tourism, and the gig economy on Wednesday, sports and society on Friday, and the banking and financial sector on the following Monday. We will send this out to everyone. Um, but do just once again want to thank all of you. And Yoshi, you kind of hit a point that the partnership now with advancement and alumni associations with executive development is filling in for the alumni that gap from when they time they graduate from college until they are completely done with their career, we are there for you. We, we will come alongside of you, provide the necessary skills, competencies, and support from your institution. Um, and that's something that I think Ann and I, if we look at the institutions we've graduated from, they don't do a good job of, right? They kind of only come back to you and they want money. That's not what we want to be about at Mason, right? That it's, it's, it's truly about impact, making a difference for our alumni. Um, and so as we end, and I wonder if you guys just have two or three more minutes, I was curious, um, each of you, what was the, just one fun question, what was the exam that you were most scared about during your time at Mason? Um, and what was it that made it scary? And we'll end, so for the last, you know, 30 something callers on the phone, a little bit of reminiscence about your time at, at George Mason. Okay, I'll start, uh, biology. I am not a biology girl. So um, that biology uh, final exam, I stayed up all night in the old student government office, which was, um, oh gosh, what was the name of that building? Was it Sub One? Yeah, Sub One, yeah, based sub on one. a Sub One. Yeah, yeah. Stayed up all night long, and then I fell asleep during the exam. I'm so tired. <laughs> I think, is it still the same Sub One, Ann? Do you know? Yeah, it's the same Sub One. <laughs> we don't call it Sub One anymore, but it's the uh, same building. I'm I'm old man. I don't I don't necessarily remember. I think I had a, a proper fear of all exams, but uh, I would say uh, the accounting exam was a was a tough one that that I do remember my sophomore year. <laughs> oh, and you don't make tough tests, do you? That's... No, not at all. I'm Down, just you know, never, never, shout out to Ann making tough tests. <laughs> Yeah, mine was like a research analysis class, but I was on the Arlington campus at the time. So I think I was running late to class with traffic too. So that was like one of my <laughs> stressful moments. Uh, once again, I, I do just want to thank, and we'll, we'll go ahead and end it um, right here. I do want to thank all the panelists. We'd love to continue to get you more involved. We have a nonprofit marketing course. So Kimberly, Chris, Yoshi, I'd love to have you, you know, come and talk to those, come and talk to our MBAs anytime. Um, I know for me, awesome. I really appreciate it. So thank you. And thank everyone for being in attendance. Um, continue to look to the Alumni Association for more content coming out in the coming weeks. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone.